Welcome to Sebastopol Carbon Conversations. The Carbon Conversations is organized by the Rahus Institute and hosted at the Sebastopol Grange. The big goal is to explore climate solutions where we can each discover ways we can each take a small to large steps and help shape a better future. We're inspired by Project Drawdown's um, 100 Solutions to Reverse Global Warming, focusing on climate solutions. Check the website at drawdown.org for more information. Additionally, we're inspired by um, Mary DeMocker's Climate Revolution, Parents Guide for Climate Revolution, Greta Thunberg's books, and Project Drawdown books. Past Carbon Conversations are archived at rahus.org slash scc, Sebastopol Carbon Conversations. This month's topic is electrifying your home. Since 2010, my family and I have lived in an all-electric home and uh, embraced every aspect of it. We incorporated solar systems, heat pump water heater, heat pump space heating, cooling, clotheslines, and eventually uh, electric vehicles. It's been great being able to incorporate our what were our hobbies into our lifestyles. All electric meant we can maximize use of renewable energy to stabilize our energy bills, improve safety concerns, and reduce our carbon footprint. We have not regretted our decision to build all electric. Our bills are stable, it's comfortable, and it works. Tonight we'll focus on retrofitting existing homes. Coming up in May, the next Carbon Conversation topic will be Campus Climate Connections. We'll hear about projects that are happening uh, at Annalee High School and also Sonoma Academy, but we'll also talk about how we can do better and find space for students to work on climate projects. Finding space in clubs, classes, and on campus for students to explore climate solutions. Coming up on April 20th at the Santa Rosa Junior College is Climate Action Night. You might want to check it out. High school students and college students will be sharing about climate legislation and other climate initiatives locally. Coming up in June, on June 7th, we'll, the next Carbon Conversation in action in June is about focusing on electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging, EV sharing, and more. We'll also have a lot of vehicles uh, in the parking lot to check and check out and share information. Thanks to our sponsors for this evening, Bayren, the Bay Area Renewable Energy Network, and Redwood Energy. Our agenda for this evening, we'll start with Sean's presentation. Steve and Lisa Pierce will share about their uh, electrification experience. We'll hear from Bayren, Rising Sun, and then follow up with some Q&A. So let's get started. We're going to turn it over to Sean Armstrong from Redwood Energy. All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Let's see here. Can you hear me well? Yeah, let's see. Keep talking. Okay, I'll keep talking here. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for hosting me. Um, I love the Grange, by the way, just as an institution, I've studied it. It's history, it's role in democracy and women's rights and youth rights. And Granges have done great things over their time. And they continue to be uh, sort of hotbeds of, of community activism. I love that about the Grange movement. So thanks everyone for coming tonight. How's the audio now? Good. I'll, should I keep on talking while you fiddle with it? It's good. Oh, it's good. Can I can I start then? Yeah, you're good. Okay, here we go. All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> check one, two, three. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk um, about electrifying your house uh, with comfort and cost in mind. So in the lower left-hand corner, that's a booklet that we've written that's an online for free uh, resource. And on the right-hand side, it's a, a, a tab on our website is the power efficiency calculator, like a, a formal tool for electricians or electrical engineers or yourself 
you know, it's just a, the National Electrical Code. Um, we have like a YouTube there that's, um, if you want to watch like a 30 minute instructional video on how to do this. So I, these are resources to go deeper than I'm going to do in the next 30 minutes or so. But I want you to know that uh, they're there for you. If you want to take it slow, read for a little while, watch something for 40 minutes, you know, that those resources are there for you. So a <clears throat> uh, quick introduction. Um, I grew up on a Wisconsin farm, uh, back to the land movement in Wisconsin is a real thing. And my parents were of that movement. And uh, so I still live on a farm and that's a Cooney Cooney pig. I imported these cute little pigs and they were used in uh, like Black Widow, uh, Scarlett Johansson's uh, vehicle there, um, as well as uh, Nicolas Cage's movie Pig. Or these are descendants of these Cooney Coonies I brought over from New Zealand. Then I went to college up here in Northern California, um, and I learned from the Campus Center for Appropriate Technology about how to do home renewable energy. So that was wind turbines, put in a wind turbine, put in solar electric panels, built with straw bale, built with cob, composting toilets, greenhouses, pedal power, a lot of pedal power experiments, biodiesel, made biodiesel um, with Panama Bartholomew of the Building Decarbonization Coalition. We're college friends from the Campus Center for Appropriate Technology. The last demonstration house left from the Carter era. The university college students funded it themselves in the Carter era. And so when Reagan came in and disappeared all of that funding, this was the only building left standing in the whole country. Um, and still there, fantastic institution to, to learn from. I thought, oh, I'll be a high school science teacher. Struggled at that, loved the kids, uh, but kind of a rabble rouser myself. Like I'd gone to Humboldt to learn how to be an earth first activist as well as a more professional activist, but an activist. <laughs> so it worked great with the kids, not so much with the principals. So I went to um, kind of more of a wild, wild west situation, which was a development firm, general contractor, and said, I'll be your greeny weenie and I'll help you guys make a business model that makes money. And that did work. So I started a company called Danco Communities uh, it's an affordable housing developer that works in your region. Um, our, our most interesting project coming up is we're trying to do an off-grid, like 130-unit project in Petaluma, solar-powered, battery exclusively. So um, started doing all electric, 100% solar-powered housing. We did one in four of those in North America, one in two of the all-electric residences in California uh, between 2010 and 2020 were in our portfolio, all affordable housing because it uh, lowers the cost of construction. So um, and I've been a, so I left Danco Communities in 2011, and then and I worked for a company called Pacific West Communities. Anyway, was, there's a few different companies I was working for, but Danco Communities is the, the through line. <laughs> um, and then I've been a consultant since 2011, and working all over the country, uh, trying to be Johnny Appleseed of how do you do all electric 100% solar powered affordable housing. So along the way, I've learned from other places that all electric construction is quite common, just not in California. Uh, our energy crisis of 1973, our energy crisis of 2000, these things radically changed policy in ways that we're just starting to, to pull our heads out of. But you can see like in neighboring Arizona, 40% all electric construction, Washington, 42%, Florida, 77% all electric construction, uh, Hawaii, 72%. So the rest of the country understands basically that uh, and you can see how cold climates to the north and not on the coast, cold climates, they're behind us because cold climate heat pumps only became available in the United States in 2009. So these areas generally didn't do heat pumps naturally the way that the southern part of our country used single speed old fashioned heat pumps because they only used a little bit of electric resistance but they didn't have cold climate ones until recently. So we're on our way now. We have everything we need to electrify. So this is good because things are changing. Um, we just had the Bay Area Air Quality Management District vote to ban the sale of gas water heaters in 2007, gas furnaces in 2009. Uh, California Air Resources Board say they're going to similarly end the sale of gas uh, of home appliances in 2030 to sell them for any purpose, just like we've done the same thing with kerosene uh, lamps and, and gas jet light bulbs, quote unquote, like, you know, the old fashioned gas jets and coal stoves and a whole bunch of dirty fuel we've already transitioned our economies out of. And this is going to be the next step, just sort of a natural progression as we get cleaner stuff. And we have the dirtiest air in the country in California.
And we are in fine company over in the European Union. They've been doing this for years. Uh, Zurich, Switzerland was the first city in, in the European Union to ban gas and new construction starting back in 2011. And they said that they were going to start um, replacing and shutting down gas to districts of the city, which they started in 2016, followed by uh, the Netherlands, Amsterdam, also in 2016, started the policy part of it. And all these other countries here, they're, they're basically um, banning gas boilers, which is the main way that uh, Northern Europe does space heating is with gas boilers through radiators and such. So all these, these boiler bans are, are, uh, have teeth. But now I'm going to introduce you to the fact that it doesn't have to be all uh, sticks. It can be carrots, too. <laughs> so this is the Silent 120. This is the largest of these uh, silent yachts. They're completely solar powered with battery storage. They can go 100 miles a day. You never need to go into port other than to get like food and water and such. They come with a helicopter and also a submarine all of which are powered off the solar panels. So the smallest of these yachts is 60 feet, but this is the Silent 120 is the big one that comes with the, the submarine. So because, it, you know, you can't really do fossil fuel combustion in submarines underwater for a variety of understandable reasons. Where does the air come from <laughs> that, that you're burning? You have to do it with electricity in some way to do submarines successfully. So, um, at least for very long. So this is the strategy, you know, like you, you stick in batteries and you get really efficient components for everything. You can do this uh, in cold climates. So this is an upstate New York, Ellicottville. And this is a, in the summer, it's a golf resort with three swimming pools, heated swimming pools outside and like another three or four hot tubs. And in the winter time, um, it's a ski in resort. So you can ski right into the, the single how the single outdoor heated swimming pool that they run and the two hot tubs, all of which are from heat pumps. Um, they are specifically from AquaCal. So there's an air source heat pump that heats the swimming pool to like, you know, 80, 90 degrees. And then there's a water source heat pump that pulls heat out of the swimming pool into the hot tub. So it gets up to like 110 degrees. And all that's done in a balanced, you know, designed way so that the swimming pool stays at its design temperature as do the hot tubs. And it's called like two lifts having, you know, going from, say like negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside air to 80 degree water and then 80 degree water up to 110 degree. <clears throat> now, it hasn't really been since the era of like the 1960s and 70s that people thought cigarette smoking in house was luxurious, but people are still thinking that gas stoves have a certain luxury ambience to them. So on the left-hand side, that's one of my staff, Becca, she's taking a photo here over a gas stove. And what you're seeing is the heat so that's not actually a campfire in front of her because you can't see the invisible combustion off of gas stoves. You can see the wavy lines, just like you can see once a car gets going, you know, the exhaust that comes out, you don't really see smoke anymore, but you know, it's, you know, it's smoke, right? <laughs> so it's the same stuff going on here. And you can see the heat. You can see there's clouds of it around her all the way up in her face, clouds of this heated uh, combustion pollution. On the right-hand side, you can see there's a dotted line that says the EPA's legal limit for nitrogen dioxide and outside air is 100 parts per billion. Everywhere in the United States is in compliance to outside air. The worst of it is about 60 parts per billion. On the left-hand side, you see what happens in your kitchen. This is the California Air Resources Board's data. Our government has tested a gazillion dishes that burnt and cooked it different ways. And they're showing, like, look, if you cook on electric stoves, you're within safety-ish thresholds. This is just the oil burning that you like, the butter or the olive oil. That's the kind of smoke you're getting. But as soon as you start putting in a gas stove, just one dish gets you above the legal limits for outside. Cooking a full meal, guaranteed toxic air in your kitchen. That's just smog. That's all it is. It's like a mixture of, if it's, especially if it's a sunny day, like, you know, Sunday morning cooking stuff, you have full on smog once you get the sunshine involved. But the nitrogen dioxide is terrible for your lungs. It's as bad as a cigarette smoker living in your house, smoking about two packs a day. Each time you cook on a stove, um, like a cigarette is maybe 15 BTUs, 20 BTUs, and a, cig and a stove burner is 6,000 BTUs. So you can see how much cigarettes essentially you're burning when you have the stove on like high or something like a gas gas stove because it turns all into air pollution it's just like the car exhaust kind of invisible but uh, back in 1995 i read this terrible study essentially where they studied about 600 households half and half with um they had a gas stove 
but no cigarette smoker in the house because people used to smoke in the house back in the in 90s. And then this is like elderly couples, a lot of it. So then they had a couple where they would have uh, an electric stove and a smoker in the house. And they did these variables to test, is a gas stove like having a cigarette smoker in the house? And yeah, same asthma, heart attack medication you have to take as a consequence of having a gas stove in the house, cardiopulmonary disease symptoms, you know, chest tightening, all these symptoms come with gas stoves because they put out huge amounts of nitrogen dioxide, which is terrible for your lungs. And you burn a lot of it. So fancy, luxurious restaurants have been going all electric for quite a while. Alinea here in Chicago, uh, where the Obamas would eat. Technology becomes a very powerful creative tool for us. It gives us more ways to manipulate the food in unexpected and new ways. It just becomes a creative outlet for us. So this is a, he's got three Michelin stars. These are all three Michelin star chefs here, all of whom have retrofitted their kitchens to all electric and then are commenting on it. Um, and I found them all through YouTube, just personally searching this down. So uh, this guy, Chef Heston Blumenthal, where literally the royalty goes and eats just outside of London. He says, I never thought after 20 years I'd be standing in a kitchen like this. It's absolutely amazing. And he has all these amazing dishes. And then the last one is arguably the best chef in all of Europe, period. Um, Rasmus Kofwed. He says, I designed the kitchen myself. It's a gastronomic theater. It's very open. So we can meet meet the guests, and they can see that we enjoy our work. Um, he's won the Bocuse d'Or. His off, like he only tried to win it once, and then his his uh, sub chefs have also won it, and his restaurant's insane, and he's he's quite a big deal. So I try to make the point, like you know, this is the good stuff. When did we get access to the all electric lifestyle? It was in 1962. In 1947, 60 amps was what um, was like the, re the minimum requirement. And I guess I should point out in Berkeley, there was a huge uh, earthquake induced fire. And like in 1919, 1920, 21, they had an all electric building code, in which people only had 30 amps delivered to their house and they had transfer switches. And I'm going to talk about it at the end of the presentation. And that code it was an all electric building code to stop fires, which is still <laughs> one of the great reasons to go all electric. Um, Okay, so then 60 amps and then 100 amps. And 100 amps got the job done. These are the people who got the job done. They had the number one television show on Sunday nights in the 1950s. It was the General Electric Theater. It was directed by Ronald Reagan after he'd retired from Hollywood, so to speak. He became the spokesman and he directed all these plays in which he recruited everyone who's anyone in Hollywood to come and show up. And he had an all electric demonstration mansion, same idea that you know that Jimmy Carter did later. The electric utilities, like 1900 of them invested in making him a really nice mansion that he then did infomercials with Nancy Reagan and the kids and such showing off all the electric appliances. Oh, and also he got that great communicator thing from opening up clean nuclear power plants all around the country. Now, we all understand that nuclear power has some really huge issues with, uh, say, Three Mile Island or Fukushima and the fact that we don't have a new permanent storage place for nuclear waste. Um, but at the time, they were thinking that there are solutions to these problems. So I'm trying to make the point that in 1962, they won the battle and they got a 100 amp service, which is enough for all electric homes. And some of those houses built in 62 and 68 and 72 and such, all electric on a 100 amp panels, those still exist. There's just a, a friend of mine who is sending out an email saying like, hey, I've got one of those houses. <laughs> it's still all electric and it's still 100 amps from the 60s. Um, what I'm talking about here from left to right, so a 50 amp panel you commonly find on a, uh, like in a manufactured home park, they might have a 50 amp panel. 100 amps is what everyone has, that's enough for all electric house. 200 amps is what the code minimum in California is since 2016 to accommodate large solar arrays because you can only put 16% of the panel's capacity back into the, into the panel with solar. That's, by the way, one of the examples of how um, there's a lot of misinformation about how solar impacts the grid. You're only allowed to put a tiny bit back into the grid. It has doesn't have impacts on local transformers and infrastructure. That's not a thing. 
Um, and it's been proven time and time again all over the world as renewable penetration with rooftop solar and such gotten up to 50% and 60%. This, this is not a problem. Uh, that's because only 16% can go back in. So then the 400 amp panels, this is what you might see in like a 3,500 square foot house with everything's electric resistance, electric resistance water heater, electric resistance hot tub outside, everything's electric resistance space heating. That's crazy ass 40, 400 amps. I was in one of those houses once, it blew me away. And so demonstrably it's enough. This is pg e territory, 22,442 homes. This is home energy analytics, Steve and Lisa Schmidt. Um, brilliant folks, and they got to study a really big sample of pg &E's customers. Mm -hmm. And you can see here that the peak is right around where 30 amps, and that's what trailer homes get in a trailer home park, an old trailer home park, you get 30 amps. And then you see 50 amps, the manufactured homes more commonly, and that's most, <laughs> most of the homes in the study. 80 amps, you get like 60 to 80, 60 to 90 amps, 60 to 100 really in apartments. You see it all over because apartments don't have a minimum. It's just whatever the design is and maybe other reasons too. But so I'm just saying about 80 amps. And then houses, 100 amps. So on their stats, they're pointing out that 98% of the homes that they study, these 22,000 homes, 98% of them, their peak power over a 15 minute increment in the whole year, which is how the code is determined, their peak power was less than 88 amps. So they fit on a 100 amp panel. And 86% are less than 50 amps. <laughs> so you can see why 30 amp and 60 amp households can be all electric. The one I'm standing in right now is a 30 amp all electric tiny house. Um, and you can also see how load management could sometimes be important for people like that every once in a while, someone has craziness. One house that peaked out at 329 amps. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is the big impediment to electrifying your home. You might think it's some other thing. It's not. This is the thing. This is the thing that takes the most time and the most money. So you look at all the things in red. That's the stuff that you're going to pay for and are going to have um, what's called green book violations, most likely. When they come to do your service upgrade, they'll say some part of this red thing doesn't comply with PG&E's green book. You're going to have to replace that. You're going to have to close that window. You're going to have to put a firewall there. You're going to have to penetrate the roof. You're going to have to put in a cement pad. You're going to have to <laughs> So don't touch it if you don't have to. <laughs> and then the blue part is the part that's like everyone else pays through their, their, um, their rates. Pardon me here. Oh, and I want to point out is that when we, we studied the PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric hired us for a year and we surveyed everyone that we could possibly pay to talk with, which is lots of people. And basically, was like we surveyed like 100 folks who had a service upgrade, and more than half of them had something really unexpected happen that they talked about being a terrible experience. <laughs> more than half. So what did it cost from top to bottom? $1,300 to $5,000 for the service upgrade fee. Okay? But then there might be a breaker panel upgrade, another $1,300 to $5,000. So you don't get away with it for less than $2,500. No one did. $2,500 is the minimum, but it goes up to $30,000. And so going down there, new branch circuits, those are cheap. If you're going to put a few wires in your house, that's cheap. Don't worry about that. More wires that can be safe. More wires can be like get them grounded. More wires and GFIs. Good things happen from a professional electrician putting in more wires. But I'm trying to talk about not a huge copper wire, a bigger, thicker one coming from the street. That's going to cost you real money and time. If it's trenching on your land, it's expensive and difficult. But if it's trenching on the, underneath the sidewalk or underneath the public road or any of that kind of stuff, super expensive. Transformer upgrade, you might be the person that triggers a transformer upgrade or even a pole replacement. You know, the stuff that's there, they're willing to leave alone. But you, you asking for a big service upgrade for your things, that cost, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. And there's also, there can be more. Just $13,000, $18,000 overhead to underground conversion. That's a bunch of money, taking it underground. Trenching, if you take it underground, because it's super expensive per linear foot. Same thing with overhead line, if it's service only, but not as expensive as going underground. So why did this happen? 35 electricians responded, and they, they said, well, this is why we did it. 
And they all felt like they'd done the right thing. None of them were being mean about it. Like, we did him a favor. Well, you know, it's an expensive favor you did. So why? They said, well, they put in an EV charger. And I'm going to solve all these problems in this conversation we're having for the next few minutes. So none of these are problems. Put in an EV charger. Uh, Well, you could have done other EV chargers, load management EV chargers, load balancing EV chargers. Put in solar. Oh, well, you could put in a clipping inverter so it cuts off the amount. So you can just keep that 16% going in, even though you have an array that essentially could put in like 25%. It just, on average, then it's putting in closer to like 20% or 22%. You clip some of it during the peak of the day, clipping inverter. Didn't have to do a service upgrade. Uh, putting in HVAC system that could have put in a cold climate heat pump. Age of the home. That's kind of unclear what they're saying, but... It's only if it had like a 60 amp service. A 60 amp service is a legitimate reason to go up to 100 amps. Might not need it, but I I have a hard time arguing against it. (laughs) So technically, do you need it versus like, yeah, you should probably do it. Um, Pools and spas, same story. Um, Accessory dwelling units, you can do load balancing sub panels, kitchen circuits. These things like kitchen circuits shouldn't trigger service upgrade. Unless your service is just very old, fine. There's a, so there's a small amount of 30 to 60 amp services out there. This is where I'm standing right now. This is a 30 amp 240 volt line that's powering my all electric little home. You can see on the lower left hand side that it costs $700 total for the things I'm gonna show you. My little electric resistance heater, I have a very well insulated tiny house. Uh, it's all wool from a, a wool bedding company and it's two by six walls. and super insulate as best I could, but it's very warm in here. I have an HRV up here for air circulation. So little heater, that's a two gallon water heater. So it's just enough for the kitchen sink. Um, a two burner electric resistance countertop, uh, Euro Dib is my favorite. They're kind of pricey at 350 bucks or so. Um, so I usually get the, um, well actually the one I have right now is by Chef Top and it's like 130 bucks. So it depends on what you want to spend. And then there's that oven. Um, I don't have that oven. I, I got a nicer one that I like more. But essentially, it all just costs 700 bucks. Here are tiny houses for ho- for um, formerly homeless veterans. So uh, 14 houses got built. There are 400 people who are homeless and veterans in Santa Rosa, Sonoma County. Um, so 14 got built. <laughs> and uh, it was important because the, the county was only loaning us the land to get this done. And so they didn't have, want to give more than, I think, a 400 amp total service. So each house got 60 amps at 240 volt. And we had to, these are these homes are almost three times the size of the one I'm in right now. And uh, got it done. I had to do power efficiency. Here we have 100 amp uh, small homes. These are built in 26, 2014 in Fort Bragg. 26 homes, though, that are zero net energy for low income seniors. So on the left-hand side, ductless mini splits. Duct work has to have a stronger fan. There's more friction, more heat loss. Ductless is often how people convert to a, um, an electric heating system because it's just nicer. It means different rooms have a different remote control and it's silent. Like duct work is noisy when the furnace turns on and it like shakes and rattles and super annoying. Um, so ductless is silent. So if you like, if you like it quiet, um, then heat pump water heater, and then uh, this is a five burner electric resistance smooth top stove. So it's like $600, not $2,000, because this is low income housing. And the whole thing, including installation, is eleven grand in this house. These are 100 amp homes. Now, don't read this. Just look at the different blue bars and what the top set is for space heating, and there's different options there for taking different amounts of power. My point here is that same with heat pump water heaters, there's different options. In cooking, there's you if you explore, if you have a hundred amp limit for your house, there's many different ways to get there. And so the same thing with cooking, with laundry, with electric vehicle charging, and also you can sort of go in the other direction if you do power sharing plugs, I'll show you in a sec. So these are all just lots of options. It's detailed in that book that I mentioned, it's free, it's the download, just is right there. But here are some examples. So on the left-hand side, a combined washer-dryer, condensing washer-dryers used all over the world predominantly. United States is pretty much the only people that do this thing where we duct an electric resistance dryer out. Everyone else does condensing, which is electric resistance, just a little more efficient, and you don't have to do duct work 
it, you just like, and they're small and they can do washing at the same at time as drying. So I have this one, I love it. Um, then the, the new 120 volt heat pump water heaters, the Ream Pro Terra. Then you can see Innova makes a very nice sort of wall mounted, uh, just so it just plugs in, 120 volt plugs in. It's a wall mounted heat pump. It's quiet, you barely hear it. And you just do two little ducts through the wall. And then on the right hand side, that's a ductless mini split. But once again, this can plug into any outlet. It doesn't use more energy than about 60% of the outlet it's being plugged into, which is code compliant. That's not too much. They can share just normal plugs. But I want to point out, if you want to get something done quickly, this is the least expensive way that's okay. Medea, which also sells the same thing under um, Toshiba, they make the only inverter um, ultra quiet. An inverter is a computer. These do-it-yourself portable heat pumps, almost all of them are terrible. But this one's good because it's quiet and reasonably efficient and has a very good hose design, which matters. And the way it fits into the window is good. And so I'm just saying, if you want to get your house that's like 1,000 to 1,500 square feet cool in the summertime, this would do the job efficiently for $700. And you could electrify it also for space heating. It would do most or all the space heating that you needed in the wintertime, except probably on cold nights, you might have to plug in an extra electric resistance heater or two of these. It's cheap. Um, a, a whole bunch of my staff have them. Uh, my partner has one for, had one for a year and a half because his ground heat pump was broken and he couldn't get someone to fix it. And it worked better, he said, <laughs> than his ground heat pump. <laughs> his $30,000 system. <laughs> okay, so here you can see the range of efficiency of heat pumps. It actually goes all the way up to SEER 42. In yellow, that's the air conditioning efficiency. The federal minimum is 14, and the Biden administration is trying to move it up more to 19 through the Inflation Reduction Act funds. And it goes up to 42. Carrier sells a 42 SEER efficiency heat pump. The black is space heating efficiency. The minimum is 8.2 heating seasonal performance factor, HSPF. And uh, just like okay ones are 10 and 11, and the good ones are 13, 14, 15. <clears throat> this is about air leakage. So I'm not suggesting that you try to re-insulate your house when you electrify. I am suggesting that you find out where the air leaks are and you get some caulk out. Cheap caulk. Easy for anyone to do is to clip the tip of a caulk thing and go around and caulk cracks in windows, around door frames, uh, put little gaskets in the, the electrical outlets and the plugs so the air doesn't come whistling through. This is a cheap way to reduce the amount of heat pump you need by one third. Don't have to insulate, just get rid of air leaks, take it from normal leakage down to fairly tight, and uh, the heating needs and the, and the power needs that you need to plug in and the heat pump that you're sizing it for, all that goes down by a third. Now, this is my little mist-based electric fireplace. It just shoots out like a vaporizer mist that's cool to your hand, but that has halogen bulbs underneath it or LEDs. And this is my daughter um, on like the first day I ever plugged it in and she was just over the moon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> She's whatever, I think she's six six and a half something like that and she just kept it sticking her hand in and it doesn't hurt i mean it's, it's just mist cool mist so it was magic actually we won an award i submitted the 45 second thing of her being like it's amazing um and we got like a valley silicon valley clean energy gave us a little a, like innovative award a fire water a fire design this is a, a company that custom makes them more like for restaurants or fancy houses uh dimplex you buy these things online, you know, they're great. They're, you install them and such, but this is for high end. So I'm just saying it's a different quality experience. And they have LEDs in these and you can change the color with a remote control. You can make the whole thing rainbow. You can make it, you know, like who won the Super Bowl that day colors. You can make it like Hogwarts, any of that. Any colors come out of these mist fireplaces. And it's just a the theatrical effect been used for decades in theaters. But boy, does it look like fire. Uh, yeah, so here's these examples. Um, and you can put stone facades around them, make them look like anything. They can go outside if they're in ski lodges or your ski house up in the hills. Um, if you want to have an outside fireplace, they come with electric resistance heaters that will blow hot air out while having the fireplace. So if you also, uh, for 
see, I just want to make sure. I'm, yeah. Okay. So this is in the context of I've done heating fireplaces. Now the fire stoves, giving you guys ideas on how to rapidly, easily electrify your house. These all plug in. Oh, and I should say, like the Dimplex, these fireplaces, these just plug into the wall, including the heater that comes with them. They're just 120 volt, plugging in anywhere, and you have a fireplace. So um, these are plugging in anywhere kitchen options. So um, my mother-in-law, Nan, she died in the Tubbs fire in 2017. And uh, while I had been an electrification consultant for many years, the stove was the one thing that hadn't given up. That's why I kind of attacked it at the beginning of this presentation, because I once thought that I loved my gas stove and I wasn't so sure if I wanted an electric stove. Um, Nan dying definitely uh, changed everything. And so we we immediately ended that relationship, yanked out the gas stove. And uh, we've never actually gotten a, a full on blown big stove. Instead, we've always had like two and one burners, which allows us to spread the cooking zones out in this old farm kitchen instead of being all clustered together. It actually worked out really well. So, um, and also they're super controllable and they're cheap. And as a farmhouse, we actually didn't have that much money. <laughs> I'm always like struggling to pay the bills, you know? So this became a, a great option. For my mom who's here, she, I did get a very nice double oven kitchen stove when I had a little bit of money and, and she takes care of our kids and she deserved a good stove because she bakes for us every single day. So um, you can get a walk. This is like a $250 nice walk. Um, the duck's top, great stuff. If you're just getting rid of like your normal 30 inch uh, range, there's a whole bunch of ranges out there, or induction ranges, there's certainly electric resistance, smooth tops. You can get electric resistance smooth top from like 20 inches up to huge. Induction, I think the smallest is 24 inches. Um, an induction that Blomberg makes. And most people have like a 30 inch. So anyway, um, if you get electric resistance smooth top, those things cost like 600 bucks for a nice one. If you get induction, it's more like 2000, 2200, could be as cheap as $1,000 with Frigidaire, but getting the cheapest product on the market of anything is usually not the best deal in terms of quality. And they're not, the Frigidaires have uh, small, like five inch induction burner coils as opposed to like eight inch or 10 inch. So you get what you pay for. Um, and then it might cost you 500 bucks to put in a 240 volt wire. Here's barbecues, if you like cooking outside. Um, Weber is by far and away the one that gets the best reviews on Amazon and such, but Kenyon and George Foreman. And, and essentially if you've been on a boat, all the kitchens in, in uh, like cruise boats and usually in any other kind of boat in a need to be electric because open flames on boats are dangerous. Um, so the, a lot of the places you can find electric barbecues are in boat supply catalogs. Now, if once again, 120 volts, so I'm saying plug it in anywhere, but you can still have a good life. So on the left-hand side, this is a standard electric resistance vented dryer for 800 bucks. That's 120 volt. It'll take about twice as long, but you can just plug it in. And in our country, about 80, 88% of all the dryers in our country are electric now. And one of the only places that's not true is California. <laughs> no, like, that's the truth. The dryers are like everywhere in our country are electric. You probably have one too. But if you don't, this is the easy way. In the middle, you see um, a electric vented dryer. Once, Oh, pardon me. I had that wrong. In the middle is the vented one. On the left-hand side is a heat pump dryer. So it's very efficient and not vented. And on the right-hand side, that is a compact vented as well. So two vented, the middle and the right, and a heat pump one on the left, 120 volt. Just like I showed you the condensing washer dryer earlier, also 120 volt. All these things can plug in. You can do whatever you want. You can plug in any of these things anywhere. And if you have uh, now an open available like 240 volt, 30 amp plug where the dryer was, just hypothetically, you could you unplug a dryer, put in a 120 volt one like we did. And then you've got a great 240 volt circuit for fast EV charging. And if you wanna keep that plug and keep that dryer, you can plug it into a load sharing plug here. So like uh, the Neo Charge or the Simple Switch, these, or from the dryer buddy, the idea is that you have one 30 amp 240 volt plug for a dryer. 
but that's enough power for an EV charger and for uh, an induction stove potentially. Um, it well, some induction stoves, yes, not all of them, not those so much the big ones, but it's certainly enough for a heat pump water heater that might be two forty volt. You can use one plug for two devices. They're just plug strips that I'm showing you here. Usually, you only plug two things into this plug strip because these are small versions. These are just for the plug. But I'm going to show you sub-panel versions where you can plug many things into the one, one circuit. So uh, these are all options just for sharing one existing plug or putting in a new circuit and then sharing that, that um, outlet, I should say, with two things. Here is an example of uh, a load flexible EV charger on the left hand side. So you can plug this into a, a, um, an outlet that it can decide how much power your house has available to it. That's pretty wild where it can vary the amount of power and it can, and it can plug two things into it. So you can have two cars going and vary the amount of power that's demanding for each one. So the cool little load balancing EV chargers out there can reduce the number of plugs you put in. On the right-hand side, this is next step stuff. So Wallbox has been cooperating with Nuve, and they say this year at some point they're bringing out their um, bi-directional charger where you can charge your house off your car. And a Tesla Powerwall is 13 kilowatt hours. Um, a, a fast Tesla is 130 kilowatt hours. A Ford F-150 is 130 kilowatt hours. There's 10 times as much battery frequently in some of the bigger EVs as there is in a Tesla power wall. And so you can have access to all of that battery with a bi-directional EV charger, um, just like the decibel there on the right-hand side. One of those is going into an Oakland house this spring. And uh, the decibel, by the way, that not only does the bi-directional charging, it also will balance loads in your house. If you have like a power outage, you can decide what things you want, which circuits you want to have active, which ones you might turn off so that you don't run out of battery power. And to show you this visually, on the left-hand side, that's the amount of power an electric resistance dryer takes. The next one down, that's a heat pump dryer. That's the amount of power it takes. So if you put in a heat pump dryer, you free up lots of power. And it's 120 volt, ideally. And then you have the, the 1400 watt condensing washer dryer and a level two, 30 miles per hour of charging. A level two charger is that same amount that you have with the electric resistance dryer. And that's how you can see why you might do a balancing uh, plug. So you can, you can plug in your dryer and you can plug in your EV charger into the same outlet and just run your laundry. And when the laundry is done, then your EV charger can go for it. Sub panels, same idea. This is a lumen. So you have any one circuit, it's like, sure, one standard 20 amp circuit breaker in your circuit breaker panel, you can plug six things into that. You essentially make six circuits and it will decide if ever all six of those circuits are actually using enough power to trip off that 20 amp circuit, it will decide which things get turned off. You'll program it and say, I would like to turn off this thing, not this thing. You'll set up priorities. Now you don't have to do all six circuits but that's the its capabilities is that you can put in this sub panel and have a, a manifold of extra circuits coming out and do load balancing off of it and then plug the lumen into your existing circuit breaker panel. This is replacing the circuit breaker panels with something like what I just showed you, just bigger. Now every single circuit has the potential to be switched on and off and there's a whole bunch of them there for you. And, uh, and so you can take a 100 amp uh, service and you can plug in 400 amps of stuff. And you wouldn't be able to do that <laughs> code compliantly without either the span panel there on the left uh, made I think in San Diego or the Coben Genius panel that's on the right, which is up in Canada, but available here in the US. Now taking all these strategies together, this is on the left-hand side, this is a pretend circuit breaker panel. So all these blue Little boxes indicate things that are code minimum, and we've done nothing tricky. But this is a 100 amp panel, and in green, we have a slightly more efficient forced air blower on the left-hand side, and we have a more efficient heat pump, and we have a more efficient EV charger. It's uh, only 19 miles per hour, but still you know, gets the job done. I charge my car at three miles per hour. That's a standard 120 volt, 1400 watt plug-in. So this is still level two stuff. 
Uh, only 16 amps of solar going in, but a solar edge inverter, as I mentioned, that can take it up to 5.9 kW on that. So we could have 5.9 kW on this 3.8 kW inverter. Then on the right-hand side, a hybrid heat pump dryer, uh, just having the, a 40 amp stove instead of a 50 amp stove, and then a heat pump water here that is has some electric resistance, but not as much as possible. And that did the job on a 2,000 a 2, square foot house without anything expensive or tricky with load sharing plugs or panels or sub panels, just efficient stuff that you can just buy. 3,000 square foot home in green on the left-hand side, we have a ductless heat pump, abandon the duct work because that takes a lot of power. We still have a solar edge clipping inverter. Um, so up to 5.9 kW. On the right-hand side, you see that now we have two load-sharing plugs. One load-sharing plug is balancing a resistance dryer and a full-power heat pump water heater with like 30 amps of electric resistance. And the other one is a 40 amp, and that's balancing an induction stove oven and a really fast EV charger, 38 miles per hour. And this is to show you that big houses, little houses, all of them can run off of 100 amp services now. So. I know I went fast. You probably have some questions about your own particular house. We try to put in lots of case studies, lots of product guides, examples, all that stuff um, in these books that we have at redwoodenergy.net backslash research, free downloads. You know, they're right there, very pretty, colorful. Um, and the last thing I wanted to tell you was about money. So the new and existing, <laughs> existing got cut up in a weird way there. Um, so these are rebates. They're going to come out in this, the fourth quarter of this year from the Energy Commission. And the people who are eligible are anyone who makes 150% of the area median income or less. That might be you. If so, it's a point of sale rebate. So the contractor themselves will discount it before they charge you. The rebate amounts are 8000 for heat pumps if you make less than 80% of the area median income. So it's mostly low-income households. And then... If you're between 80% and 150% of AMI, you get half of this. So not 8,000, but 4,000. Not 1750, but oh, like $875. And you know, $840 or $420. So you can see induction ranges, heat pump clothes dryers, heat pump water heaters, spacing heat pumps, electrical system upgrades, rewiring, weatherization, like caulking. You know, $1,600 is going around and doing some stuff, all the urgent stuff to make it so the house isn't leaky. That makes a huge difference. And the contractors can get $500 of just their own incentive for hanging out and being cool with this and helping out. So they get paid to participate too. 25C is not a rebate. It's a tax credit. It's a new tax credit. This tax credit allows $3,200 a year. Anyone can take it. It's not income qualified. You can take it no matter who you are in this audience. $3,200 a year, you can get it for electrifying your house. And um, they have it broken down by the heat pumps for space heating and water heating, $2,000 a year is the most you can charge into it. And annual credit limit resets every year. So you can continue to do work in your house just year over year. Not a whole lot, but the idea is like incrementally this year, I can get, you know, if I do $10,000 worth of work, I can get $3,200 off if I do these things. It's not designed to be a huge amount of money, but it is available to everybody. And when the Biden administration was negotiating with Manchin, they put a lot of money towards uh, low-income housing and households and less, more to, or less towards just market rate households. That's what happened. The last one is the solar tax credit, and they bumped it up to 30% for everybody. Everybody gets 30%. Um, and the solar contractors, they need to be using federal prevailing wage, which most of them are paying that much or more. So it's not usually an issue, but it does come with some prevailing wage requirements. And that's it. That's my presentation. And I'm happy to help you with any questions if you have them. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much. I can hear you. Okay, good. So we're gonna um, 
take a few questions from the audience and then we'll let Stephen just sort of. Margie, do you have a question for Colin? What about these um, virtual rebates going to be available and how do you find them? <laughs> the, the ones you mentioned by fourth quarter? Oh, yeah. On the so these rebates, um, just last week, the Department of Energy, Secretary Granholm put out on LinkedIn saying that they were still taking public comments from tribes, from cities, from organizations, activist organizations. So they're still soliciting public feedback to do something new. This point of sale rebate is a new thing. It's not new in the country. Like it's been done in Vermont. It's been done here and there. But it, it, they've never done anything at this scale at all. Uh, so it gets run through our energy commission, who I heard just hired about 300 new staff, about a 50% jump in staff just to handle all of the different Inflation Reduction Act proposals or monies. So massive. <clears throat> and you can imagine it's a bit of a mess over there with all these new staff trying to organize themselves to spend the money quickly during this administration as best as they can. So... I'm trying to track it, and that's the most current news. Lots of new staff over at the state, the at the state, and the the federal government has not yet decided what the rules will be. So we we still have to find out what the rules are, and then the state has to apply for the money, and then have it distributed, and then actually start spending it. <laughs> so Q4 is this. If it happens this year, it's because everyone is doing government right. You know, it might not even happen quite this year. Yeah, Could you ask that question again, Tor, for me? The BTU ratings on The BTU. The BTU ratings. Okay, so back in the olden days when there was a ton of ice that was used as a metric of how much cooling. So a ton of ice over an hour would, would make a certain amount of water. <laughs> and this cooling, right at that 32 degrees temperature mark, they described it as a BTU. And a BTU is, um, another way of describing a BTU is one matchstick burnt end to end is one BTU. One wooden matchstick burnt from tip to tip is literally the standard definition of one BTU. We obviously use much more sophisticated science on that, but old school, you have 12,000 burnt matchsticks in a, to, you have to burn 12,000 matchsticks to melt a ton of ice, <laughs> 12,000 BTUs in an hour. These old fashioned metrics, matchsticks and tons of ice. But a house most of the time is using like 12,000 BTUs to 15,000, maybe less. And then on a peak is using 24,000 to 36,000 BTUs. Like, so a really hot day when it's doing air conditioning or a really cold day in the winter time, either of those peaks could produce 24,000 to 36,000 BTUs of, of peak demand. So when you're sizing a heat pump for your house, for your heating and cooling system, HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC. Um, when, you're, when you're doing the heat pump for your space heating, you design it for your, the, like the coldest or hottest day that you'll have as a peak. And you try to get a nice heat pump that will dial it down so it's not a single speed, always blasting the same amount of hot or cold, just turning on and off like furnaces do. That sucks. You get a cold climate heat pump that has a computer that turns the, the speed of the system down or up, not on and off. And it's quiet that way and uh, much more efficient. And you, you then get it so it can turn down to just a little bit of air conditioning on a warm spring day, right? That, that's like a, a low demand. Cold climate heat pumps do that. Um, yeah. Uh, we're going to have to have a class. Really. Is it BTUs per hour? Is it shouldn't be for time? Well, let's not dig into that. I want to just take a comment here at this point. Um, there, we're going to hear from, from Bay Red and also Roger said about some incentives on the incentive picture. Uh, so, familiar you're itching to go home, some of you, so hang on, hang in there. And we have another one or two questions for Sean. Then I want also to let um, Steve and Lisa share about their spread. Sean will still be with us. 
Okay. in there. Okay. And what is what exactly? So I still have a natural gas dryer. And if I buy an electric dryer, will I save money? Uh, <laughs> it depends if you get a heat pump dryer yes because yeah. like gas dryers are about 25 to 30 percent efficient and a heat pump dryer is like 80 percent efficient so when you have such a dramatic difference between it you know the gas dryer's ability to get its heat into the laundry versus a heat pump that's when you can make a little money some pennies you know or lose a little bit of money some pennies but it's uh that's the move to make gas dryer to heat pump dryer. The bills are about the same. Gas dryer to electric resistance dryer. Like you have a gas dryer that has an electric resistance plug because it has to spin the motor, right? So it has a, a has a normal plug on it also for electricity. You could pull out your gas dryer and put in one of those 120 volt dryers I was showing here, like the heat pump one here on the left hand side by Samsung. You you put that one in, and that actually might save you a little bit of money, but it's not going to lose you any money. So, um, what question as we segue? Um, what's been your experience working with the local contractor network, and that towards your strategies of optimizing, you know, the circuits, breaker panels, load carrying, and stuff like that? Well, I know Sonoma Clean Power has been working hard to get the local contractor base familiar with electrification. And they've been working with the Switches On campaign. So um, the Building Decarbonization Coalition down in Petaluma has hired Efficiency First California and Sacramento because <laughs> so, they have this wonderful database of all the contractors in our area who have done electrification projects with public monies with rebates and have two recommendations and also two stars on Yelp or better. So have done the work, have recommendations, two stars on Yelp, and they get into the database called the Switches On database. And you can find contractors there who have done all of the work in our community, like, you know, the North Bay and such. The, this database is rich with people who have done that work in your area who aren't going to fight and kick and scream with you about trying to get rid of your gas stuff because they've done it before. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Hey, Dory or Chris, you want to come up and share a little bit? And Dante. Come on up. I'm Dora and Stella. I'm from Town of Sonoma. It was in the state of the living room. We merged now. Can you hear me? What's the microphone? Okay. I'm Dora. I'm from Town of Sonoma. Energy is the state of the living room. And now climate action is related to the living room. We merged with climate action in the living room. So it's a um, and we implemented the Gamer and Tony Plus program here in the room. So they are excited about the program. Yeah, that's right. All right, how about that? Is that better? Yes. All right. Um, I won't repeat everything I just said. And so we um, implement the Bay Run Home Plus program who is sponsoring tonight. And Bay Run's program provides information, incentive, rebates, post things to go all electric, to be more energy efficient, for that insulation, those types of things. We have some information on the table back there. Um, as a, as a, our county agency, we focus on buildings and behaviors. You may have um, attended one of our online workshop series. We, we do them quarterly. We have the new series that's starting on Wednesday this next week. I have information on the back table, um, a QR code that can take you to the registration. We're doing an induction cooking event at Premier Bath and Kitchen in, on May 6th. So we'll have a, a professional chef out and come out, try induction cooking. If you've been thinking about it, it's a great time to be able to come touch it, see it, try it, and, and get some information on it. So um, we have a lot of information and we, like I mentioned, we connect people with resources. We do free consultations for better buildings. My colleague, Chris, 
is the one that actually leads that there. She's a certified energy analyst and my go-to expert on everything building. So we have solar consultations. So if you're considering solar to match up with your electrification projects, we can help you talk through that. In fact, that's the first workshop in our series on any So if you're unable to attend, um, we send all of the workshop slides and a copy of the reporting out to anyone that's registered following that. So um, thanks. Good to see everyone showing up for this great topic. And I'm going to pass it over to John Hay with Rising Sun. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Hi. My name is Dante. Um, I'm here with Rising Sun, as Lori said. Rising Sun from Poplar Base in Oakland, and we offer a service across the entire Bay Area. Um, the program I work for is called Time of Careers. We have a youth development program. We train young folks to go into homes, and they do energy assessments and upgrades. Really, really, really simple stuff. Doesn't get into the nitty gritty that you guys all saw here, but it's a free service. It's paid for by all of you who pay your utility bill. There's a small tax that comes out of that payment that you make, and you can activate it in the form of this service. Um, if you're interested, come talk to me a little bit more. It's really straightforward. It's a summer program. These high schoolers who are trained to do this service go into your home, change all your light bulbs, shower heads, um, aerators, things of that nature, install a smart power strip. It comes at no cost to you. It's very, very straightforward. And it is as simple as coming to talk to me, putting your name on that clipboard, and then maybe doing a follow-up follow -up phone call. So very easy way to start a lot of this stuff. Um, simple as that. If you have more questions, I am here to the end of the event. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Pierce. Hi, Pierce. Mike, please. How's it? Yeah. Not Mr. Mike. Um, so we have um, some slides. Are you gonna Yeah, I'm trying. Oh the remote. Yeah. Is it over here, the remote? Oh uh, yeah. Just I need to get your your thing here. Uh, so um, I think um, probably most people by now have, have been hearing about the dangers of um, having gas cook stoves in your home, and um, I think that the other thing that um, I just want to mention is the extracting natural gas from the ground. Um, there's a lot of methane that gets leaked, and methane gets leaked all across the transmission and also when it's used. And methane is a, a major um, climate changing. Um, anyway, it's that's so there's methane, and are, are they queued up now? Yeah, it's queued up. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so this is something that really surprised me. This was from an article in the Press Democrat um, a couple of weeks ago that um, emissions from natural gas appliances account for about the same nitrogen oxide emissions as passenger vehicles in the Bay Area. So even if we have a gas stove that's, um, let's say we're getting rid of our gas stove, if we still have our gas furnace and our gas water heater, that are being vented outside, it's creating a lot of pollution in the air. So um, that was our main motivation for wanting to um, go electric. So um, we started getting a, um, we got an electric car, we saw we, um, and then we thought that our water heater was getting kind of old and uh, <laughs> That we get a heat pump water heater. We waited a little too long, unfortunately. Developed a leak, had to rent a, a another uh, water heater until we were waiting during COVID for our water heater to come in. That's a common problem. People wait till they have a leak in their water heater, and then uh oh, now maybe they're going to need some more um, power to go if they're replacing a gas water heater. Um, and so it's really great to be able to get be proactive and have some electricity, electrical work done in advance so you're ready. 
Um, so we went with a 15 amp water heater. Um, so we still have room in our panel for some other upgrades. And we went with 80 gallons, which is big. We had a space in our garage, um, but that way we had a lot of hot water. And uh, even if the power goes out or something like that, it's, it's a lot of water. And then um, we got one of those little um, portable induction cooktops, like there's one at the back table. We actually do most of our cooking on that thing. $65 and it works really well. We still have our gas range. Um, and then uh, just this last year, we replaced our gas furnace with a um, ducted mini split heat pump. And I know um, Sean was kind of, I don't know, putting down the ducted systems. We love it. Uh, we had our old gas furnace. Um, the ducts work just fine. And um, we have this new um, unit in our garage and outside it's really quiet and uh, we got it right before we had that big heat wave of 113 degrees in Sebastopol and we had AC for the first time that was really nice because in case you don't know heat pumps are heaters and air conditioners okay let's see um so um, the car chargers are are free, um, but you do need to pay for them to get in, uh, bring an electrician to come set it up. That cost us six fifty. The heat pump water heater was um, six thousand eight hundred, but we got um, incentives that the incentives have gotten better. Um, so now there's a, a combination of incentives from Sonoma Clean Power and Bayran, and Steve has a one-page sheet that's super handy for um, just spelling out all the incentives, makes it really simple. And um, the, the heat pump system that we, it's kind of confusing, they're called mini splits. But even though this is like a whole house system, um, unfortunately, we did not qualify for the incentives for this. It was our mistake. Uh, we wanted a, a system that was really good at heating. We didn't care as much about the air conditioning because we weren't going to use it very much. But Sonoma Clean Power, am I getting right? That, okay. They, um, thought that they only wanted to give incentives for ones that were really good with air conditioning. So darn, you got the wrong time. Um, and I think that's it for me. I will pass it over to Steve. Thank you. So like Lisa was saying, part of our reason for doing it was cutting down our greenhouse gases. So still having the gas clothes dryer and doing some cooking on the gas stove, we were able to reduce our greenhouse gases pretty dramatically. 97% reduction in our natural gas use. And, you know, it's kind of geeky me what, how many pounds of CO2 that is. And, and then from the electric car, it's kind of interesting, a comparable amount of CO2 reduction. We just don't drive that much. That's the main reason it's lower. So everybody wants to know, well, does it save you money? Like Jim's question earlier. That's a really hard question to answer because gas rates are high this year. And will they stay high? Who knows? But uh, what I did was I tried to compare it back to when we were had the gas units we still had the electric car. So that was back in 2019 compared to today. And we actually did save some money with what gas rates are now. Uh, switching to the heat pump, water heater, and space heating, and using that induction cooktop. And the electric car savings is pretty dramatic, even though we don't drive a lot, still a pretty big savings there. You get these slides there. There's a link there where you can see what your savings would be. 
you would switch to an electric car. So when it comes to um, incentives, you really want to look at the bay rent list of contractors. You, you have to use somebody from their list where Sonoma Clean Power, the contractors, you don't have to, they don't have a contractor list that you have to go through. And you want to combine your incentives between Bayron and Sonoma Clean Power, and then what you can take advantage of with the Inflation Reduction Act. And then the water heaters, they all come with these apps now. And you can use the app to program it so it's not running during the middle of the night when we're using more of our fossil fuel, natural gas fired power plants for electricity. You're running your water heater program to run it during the day when we have all this solar production on the grid. Yeah, if you look up a few pump water heaters online, you're going to hear some issues about noise. And uh, one thing they do say is if you want to get an idea of how loud it is, think of having a microwave oven out in your garage or wherever that water heater is going to be placed. It's about a comparable amount of noise. So there are some issues, there are, there are some techniques you can use to minimize that noise. You definitely want to use sound insulation. It's a rubber mat that can go underneath the water heater or if need be up to the wall behind it. And placement can be really important too. We made the mistake of installing it right adjacent to a bedroom wall. And you're going to hear that. And if you have the opportunity to put it on the exterior wall, or you don't have a bedroom on the other side, take advantage of that if noise is an issue for you. you know, think of that kind of microwave delay, or potentially maybe you know, a little bit of vibration. But it's something to be aware of when it comes to heat pump water heaters. And with the MIDI splits, we had this situation where it did require some adjustments after the installation. They had to do some stuff like that. Turn up the defrost setting on the outside compressor because when it got into the low 30s, it would be freezing the flat fan blade a bit. So it's not uncommon after you have one of these installed, they come out again and do some minor adjustments on your system. And it does take a little bit of getting used to. If you're used to having that gas furnace and having to heat up your house very quickly, it's going to be a bit slower, and you may end up having to keep your house at a little bit higher temperature in the middle of the night than you have with a gas furnace. So when you wake up, it doesn't have to work quite as hard early in the morning when it's in the low 30s. And de definitely want you to take advantage of the PGD. They do give you a price break if you've gone to electric heating. Uh, on a space heating. So make sure you contact them, take advantage of that, around $15 a month savings once you pay that switch. So uh, we haven't done the induction range yet, but we want to pass on experience from uh, our neighbor, Brian. He got his for $1,000. And between Sonoma Clean Power and Bayron, totally covered the costs in the inside. They were doing a kitchen remodel, so it really worked for them. And a full set of nice pots and pans from Sonoma Clean Power, free. And their quote there, they just love their stuff. So there's a picture of our, exciting picture of our water heater and uh, the, the blower unit in the garage, the, the outside compressor in our case. And I, I wanted to bring up, if you haven't seen this, this is the Sebast City of Sebastopol Electrification Survey. So there are a few of us here that are part of the Climate Action Committee from City of Sebastopol. And we're trying to get a sense of how much people are, are aware of the new technologies after tonight. You're all pros at it, uh, aware of the incentives. And what kind of assistance would be most helpful that the city or some other agency could provide. So we're really hoping people have a chance to take this. There's a QR code on the back. 
it's a very quick survey, and we're very interested in finding out what y'all think. Thank you. All right. Should we ask if anybody has any questions? Yes, for you yeah. guys. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I turned you on. Yeah. So, how many panels do you have in your electrical experiment? 100. So, we're kind of maxed out on physical space. So, at this point, if we want to do the dryer or range, we have to do some kind of switching devices or a little bit of so, some of the devices that Sean was talking about. Now, which direction do you think of well with? No, we, we don't want to do 200 amp uh, for all the reasons that Sean was yeah. talking about. I actually put a light panel against the this and the backup stove in um, case we need power. And most, most of our cooking on the little induction thing. So it's does anybody have any idea what the differential in temperature is from the outside to what the Mac would be on a on a split system? I've heard that they it can be a very low um like it's 30 degrees out, maybe it's only going to keep your house in six weeks. No, 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 not at all. It takes longer, but it, it, it works as a it's, like, it, it's definitely when it gets like below 35, you notice it takes a little longer. Okay. And other, you know, um, but it still works. It just oh, the, there's there are cold climate. Um, there are cold climate heat pumps that the Biden administration is trying to formalize what a cold climate heat pump is. And the definition that they're using, and products fit this right now, is that it maintains 100% of its heating at negative 5 Fahrenheit. Wow. So those heat pumps are out there on the market, and there's ones that produce heat at negative 30 Fahrenheit. Um, they're in that the catalog little booklet that I was showing. In the back, you can find ones that are rated by their heat productivity at like negative five and negative 17 and negative 30. So those exist, but they're not the predominant products, truly. So uh, they don't seem like they'd be super necessary in this planet here. No. <laughs> but I was concerned about a very low differential. So thank you. I uh, got an induction cooktop uh, three years ago and I've been very happy with it. It's just, it worked beautifully. Yeah. Uh, and, and it works with my pots and pans and I use mostly cast iron anyway. My big concern, and when we're talking about electrifying Sebastopol, I wish I could have reassurance on electrical supply because my, my induction cooktop works great, except when the power goes off. Yeah. You know, so I really want the city and the powers that be to give me reassurance on electrical supply if I'm talking about going all electric, which I'm interested in doing, but I don't want the power to go out. Mm -hmm. But that's some of the nice bubbles thing about the, the hot water heaters, which are, they're so easy to program when the sun's shining. Yeah. You know? and, and other Appliances that really don't work quite like that. So, so you have your own solar panels. Oh, we, we have a very shady house. So, so you're yeah. still relying on PG and E for your power. Oh, yes, got it. Well, I'll, I'll put it there. Do you guys remember when I showed you that um, the bi-directional EV chargers? Like yeah. in the Bay Area last year, thirty percent of the cars purchased were EVs, and that. The, so there's a lot of EVs <laughs> in the Bay Area. And this bidirectional charger, that's the cheapest way to get a battery so you can back up not just the things that you're electrifying on purpose, but all the electrical stuff that you want every day anyway. Like you don't want any of your stuff to get turned off. So just put it out there. That's the cheapest way to get a battery is to get an EV. Thank you. Very helpful. Yep. So right now we're in the Bay Area. Like, 
and it takes longer to heat up and then you're talking as a let's run it throughout the night the night here you get the 80 80 gallon water heater now you have hot water longer because it takes longer to heat up and the bigger picture now would be more electricity and you've got transmission lines and we're burning gas and fossil fuels to make the electricity in the first place people are over these transmission lines because we get from home where we can have power over the lines i'm just trying to understand that is it actually more efficient and at the home site or is it just more efficient in your picture how does this work so you said you have to run it all through the night, like no, 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 it's just um, yeah. if they don't run that long, it's, no, it, yeah, heat pump water heaters they run one hour to four hours a day, according to Florida. They've, they've like done huge studies of them, and so one to four hours a day is what you have, and if you there's three different types out there right now by the amount of power they take, electric resistance backup, 30 amps, 15 amps, and what would be equivalent to four amps. So I have a four amp model. I think a summary is that it's the, the heat pump water heaters are not really controlling that much overall. And one of the things that wasn't mentioned is that you can actually program it so that it's if you have a solar system or you're just using the cheaper electricity during the day or it's more fun than that on the grid, then you can turn it off during four to nine PM, which is sort of a high price time period. You've got a lot of through the night. So it's, there's a little bit of uh stack So can't hear there going. Oh sorry. Uh, but you said that heating just a generator. Heating system on at night now longer than that, that's no. So when it was really, really cold and we, we wanted to wake up to a warm house, you know, it would it, 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 it takes a little longer if it's very cold out to heat the house. And not dramatically longer, but you know, it wasn't like the first heat was kind of you know, so, but most of the time it's pretty quick. Just when it gets really cold. So we used to set and heat down to like six or five, and then we can fill it with six to the food. Yeah. Also, I wanted to say that it's not a good thing. It's really good. It's not a good thing. 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 And uh, a lot of time is just waiting for my bed. I don't know if my heat rate is going to be able to remember all the options of how I've been maybe sort of modifying things. So, are there professionals that would help me navigate what would be the modifications? Because I'm not going to spend my long driveway to the street and do all that. That would be like too much money. So, who, how do you find someone who can help? You know what choices I would make to so work within the electrical panel and lower the back. Uh, I'll, I'll answer one part of that question. So, Chris back there will do three yeah. consultations because I like the third kill. You know, I know, I know, but she'll help you sort it out. And she's not selling you anything, she's just helping you create a strategy, right? So, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Like any sort of consultant type that could help strategize other than you? <laughs> can you hear me, Sean? No, I couldn't. Sorry, what was that? Oh, uh, so the question is like, are there independent consultants that are that we can tap into to help strategize all this information that we're presented today? Yeah. Um, and we just try to consult with the books. Like I'm not really trying to help anyone out in the audience myself. There's an organization called uh, Carbon Quitters in the Bay Area, and they do plans for people where they're, they're trying to like, I think they've gone to 200 houses now and they've just made a plan, you know, figured out what you have and then gone from there. Um, I teach a show once a month called the Ask Sean Show, the Climate Reality Project, like Al Gore's group and that, that's on the second Monday of the month. And we're doing Katie Porter's house, Representative Katie Porter. Uh, she's down in, in Orange County. So we're going to do her house soon. That'll be fun. So you can do that. Like just show up if you have questions. Um, 
that's the whole point of the show is like an hour, hour and a half of just helping people out with their questions. And so you're welcome to do that. But I think Carbon Quitters, I think Actera, A-C-T-E-R-R-A, Actera. And I think that you should go to Sonoma Clean Power. Like they have a downtown office where there's real people hanging out with all the stuff that you can touch. And you bring photos. <laughs> like take pictures of your stuff and like go in there and and talk with some of the experts that are there. They've hired really smart, like home electrification folks. So you can get some from free consulting from Sonoma Clean Power. Thank you. Just one thing that um, I could also mention is that. A lot of times if you just open up your electrical panel and take a picture of it and um, with your phone and send it to an electrician, um, they can tell you a lot without even coming to your house. So that's that's a good thing to be able to. You guys want to hang out? More questions? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I have to make dessert for the kids and put them in, into bed in yeah. about 20 minutes. Well, I apologize, but I should probably go. And answer questions, but we're going to have to say thanks to John for helping us out tonight. It was a great pleasure. Thank you all so much. If you're ever up in Arcata, you're like, please check me out. We'll go have lunch together. I'll take you to the beach. We'll have fun. So just come on up to Arcata. All right. Thanks, John. Take care. Take care. Um.